What separates a good anime from a great anime? Why do some anime stick with us long after we've watched it? Welcome to the workshop. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. We're two friends from high school and now aspiring writers. And in this podcast, we discuss and deconstruct storytelling elements in some of our favorite animes. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Workshop with Em and Chris. We know it's been a while, but today (laughs) in The Workshop, we are excited to be back to discuss the 2016 anime Descending Stories, Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju. And season one of the show presents itself as a historical drama with overtones of supernatural slash surrealist elements. The manga story was written by Haruko Komoda and the animated series produced by Studio Dean. So, Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju, which is such a long title. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to call it Showa. Like, <laughs> <Okay>. sorry, guys. <laughs> Sounds good. So, this show begins when a former Yakuza member named Yotaro is released from prison and is determined to start a new life, turning away from crime and instead dedicating himself to the art of Rakugo, the traditional Japanese craft of comedic storytelling. In his quest to learn the art of Rakugo, he becomes the apprentice to a master Rakugo performer named Yakumo. As Yotaro begins his training, Yakumo is particularly moved by Yotaro's talent and his distinct Rakugo style that starts to remind Yakumo of his own time as a young apprentice and the years he spent training alongside his late best friend, Suke Roku. As Yakumo begins to reminisce about his youth, we get a glimpse of how he rose to fame, an intimate look at the art and history of Rakugo, and the relationships Yakumo breaks and forges on his path to fame. That was a really long summary. I'm sorry. I felt like it was all necessary. Yeah. And it's yeah. also been a while since you say I've that every a time we have a long summary, though. Like, <laughs> no, but this is one it really, really necessary. <laughs> this one was really long. I felt like I was yeah. talking for like a whole minute. Yeah. It's all necessary, okay? Because there's kind of like two stories going on, as you'll see. So, as always, we will be talking about our overall impressions first. These will be spoiler-free, just our general thoughts on the show as a whole. And then once we get into the writing segment, we will be spoiling the entire first season, like the first 13 episodes. The other thing I want to mention before we get into overall impressions is that there are a lot of different names oh, yeah. for the same characters. So we're just going to lay down some Lay like, down guidelines. the law, Chris. <laughs> we're going to lay down the law, okay? So this actually only applies to the two main characters. So mm-hmm. there is the character that we will be referring to as Kiku, and then his best friend character who is technically named Sukiroku, but we're going to be referring to his like childhood name mm-hmm. that Kiku calls him, which is Shin. So yes, those are the two yes. main characters, Kiku and Shin. If you've seen the show, hopefully it won't be confusing. Okay, Makes overall sense. impressions. There's a lot to like about the show, and I did like it a lot. Um, I have pretty minor critiques, I would say, of what I didn't jive with, but they're very minor. Mm. And overall, it was a show that grew on me. The characters crept their way into my heart very slowly. Mm. And it, it was the kind of show where, like, once you're in it, you're in it. But it kind of, like, yeah. took a couple episodes for me to, like, figure out what kind of story this was trying to be. But I think the selling point for me was the fact that I, the show kind of takes on almost this, like, frame story type of narrative like the story within a story type narrative which like okay like not to go like off the rails so early in our this episode, favorite but like i'm a big fan of like any kind of like multi-generational type story or like frame stories i'm all i'm all for it it's not an easy thing to write and i think this show does it pretty well and in a lot of ways this show is very much like a coming of age story but not your typical coming of age story Um, like for one, it's a period piece that's like, it starts out in the 1930s and it spans the rest of the 20th century. And it also kind of takes key parts of Japanese history Mm -hmm. and like uses it as a backdrop to, to a lot of the story's conflicts, which I, I found really interesting. Um, like it's definitely not a focus of the show, but I think the fact that it's set against that societal context Mm -hmm. or that piece of history was really interesting to me. Um, the narrative also does a good job of teaching us about the art of Rakugo and paralleling Rakugo, I guess, as a core theme of the show alongside really strong 
character exploration. Overall, the characters were very vibrant. They were really nuanced. All of them were flawed, at times unlikable, mm. but always sympathetic. So I was very endeared to this cast and I really liked that. It was probably one of my favorite parts about the show. And I felt like they were very believable as human beings. It has wholesome moments. It has grim moments. I thought the way they mm. set up certain mysteries at the start of the story was really interesting. I think like the way they kind of use the multi-generational or like the parallel timeline a narrative style was very effective um especially because they set up um the they kind of like tease this character of shin who we are first introduced to as um someone who's already passed away right. the best friend of kiku and the father of one of the main characters in the present timeline mm -hmm. kanatsu and we're established that like you know, his death is like a sore point for these characters. We know that he's dead already. So when we flash back to the past timeline, you there it, it's kind of like this hanging cloud over that narrative right. because you're learning about Shin. You're literally following his life, right, alongside Kiku, and you're becoming very endeared to him, but you're waiting for the moment where it all falls yeah. apart to see how he died. I will say that I had some gripes with melodrama, oh. just just a little bit, just <laughs> almost non-existent towards the climax. I see. Um, but to me, you know, a couple moments of melodrama it, it wasn't detrimental to my enjoyment of the show. And stylistically, I can kind of understand why certain narrative decisions were made. And mm. it sort of cements storytelling as a core theme of the show. Mm -hmm. um, because storytelling as a concept is explored in so many ways. Like right. the frame story makes it feel like the narrative you're watching is almost a Rakugo tale in and of itself. Yes. And there are, yeah. you know, these surrealist and whimsical moments or imagery that add to that feeling. Um, so I felt like the the mangaka, the writer, was very, just very aware, like very smart writing. And lastly, as we'll discuss at the end of the writing segment, I won't talk about it now, there are some queer undertones and LGBTQ plus subtext to certain aspects of the narrative, which I have a lot of thoughts on, positive thoughts on. I'm really glad to hear that you enjoy it. <laughs> I, yeah, we are both a simp for, <laughs> for generational tales. Oh, yeah. You always Anything give me that, that has a generational when I say, <laughs> you, you give me a look when I say the word simp because you're like scared of what I'm going to say. Now. I have no idea what you're going to say ever, <laughs> ever. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad you like it. It's interesting that you felt like the climax was, it tended to be a little bit more melodramatic whereas i think that i yeah. saw it as like an intentional turn towards surrealist elements yes that, and melodrama then, sorry melodrama yeah. sorry <laughs> melodrama is perhaps yeah. not the right word i just right. have some complicated thoughts on it sure but yes yeah, i agree yeah, with yeah. you very but, surrealist and, and like a, an intentional turn turn towards like fantastical or almost like supernatural elements but yeah i definitely echo your thoughts on it being a framed story yeah. and how the characters themselves are storytellers so in doing their performance in doing their art they play many different faces but mm -hmm. then similarly kind of in their own lives it felt like they each had their very particular roles to play especially in relation to each other you know kiku for example being the uh up uptight kind of yeah. uh neat guy and then um shin on the other hand being a totally contrasting character being like the messy guy who doesn't know what he's doing but still yep. very successful yeah and then their rakugo stories being paralleled with their own stories and then the meta way in which the author is kind of like telling this grander story mm -hmm. through the characters themselves like at the very end and this isn't a spoiler or anything this is kind of yeah. just the way that they decided to wrap up the season yota mm -hmm. comes on stage and he's like well folks like yeah. this is the end of the season kind of like yeah. acknowledging that it's stories within stories within mm -hmm. stories and how mm -hmm. everything is embodied in uh, this format. It starts off as a very like quiet story in that nothing seems to really be happening, right. but everything is happening because yeah. it's kind of like we're not following the flashy, I don't know, like politics or like the drama of right. 
of shonen battles or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's not what we're following here. More so, we're following the trajectory of these people's lives. And mm-hmm. it's like a very much a slow burn. But yeah. then you just kind of, as you, the more you go along with it, the more it escalates and it escalates. And then you realize by the end of the season that there's so much implicit chaos going on. And mm-hmm. the stakes eventually involve life and death. It's like, like yeah. you get to that point and you're like, oh, you look oh, around that, and you're okay. like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I thought we were just following the story of this like yeah. dude's life, but mm-hmm. no, that's not the case. And I guess the last thing that I kind of took away or that I thought was interesting was yeah. I like how this show hones in on a particular hobby or like a profession or like an art form, kind of like like a sports anime almost. almost and what I yeah. mean, yeah, and what I mean by that is like, you get the story, you get the main plot, but you also, it incites admiration and like appreciation for people who do the art form because you realize mm-hmm. that it's not as easy as, you right. know, it might look. Um, but it still at the same time explores larger themes and emotions through its characters and, you know, using the practice of Rakugo performance at the center mm-hmm. and core of the story and then having the lives of the characters revolve around this concept. Mm-hmm. And I think that with any kind of like um, calling in life, I guess, there's a certain desire, I feel like, in in everyone who's doing it to get better and to improve. And that's kind of like, a natural story arc that's embedded Mm -hmm. straight into um straight into the story because you have this character motivation then that makes a lot of sense like if you're doing something it makes sense that you like want to get better at it so it's a very easy and effective way to write a character with a lot of ambition for example like kiku let's introduce the writing okay okay so we will go in chronological order by episode uh Mm -hmm. let's start off with episode one just talking a little bit about the introduction we do start in the present tense by uh meeting our present characters in the Mm -hmm. form of yotaro and uh, Kanatsu and Kiku in the present who is currently taking on the name of 8th generation Yakumo. For this like first episode it really it covers a lot for a single episode I think mm-hmm. like because it really has to set up all of the you know all the characters especially with Kiku's character because you know the rest of the show explores his life and his his childhood and you're kind of like you know where he ends up mm-hmm. and so it's very interesting to follow him because to to follow the journey that he has to take to to get to where he is like to that level of fame and respect and also just it does a really good job of setting up um some of the main ideas of rakugo as an art form in and of itself right because you know you come into this not knowing anything about what rakugo is and so even just the idea of like rakugo is a type of comedic storytelling where Mm -hmm. it's a single person on a stage sitting down with like no props except for like a fan yeah and they have to and so like in that in and of itself is something that you you learn in that first episode and then Mm -hmm. also the idea of like what it takes to become like a rakugo performer there's all of these ranks you can't just become one like you have to go through this very meticulous um apprenticeship process there's like a system of like how you're named, which is mm-hmm. why these characters like have all these different names. There's a repertoire of stories that you that you perform. Like it's not like you're making up the story. Like these stories have been passed down throughout generations. They've already been written. And so as a Rakugo performer, it's about how do you tell that story? Mm-hmm. Which is which is super interesting because like it's kind of like music where there's like a set repertoire that you kind of have to yeah. learn and memorize if you want to be a Rakugo performer. I just thought all of that was super cool. Could I, I want to jump in on that point about just learning about Rakugo and Mm -hmm. what it is and also its role in this show and in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, You get cuts to like the performer on stage. Like they really hone in on these like small things to show that, yeah, it's like something that the audience enjoys, but at the same time, it's like very straining on the artist performing it. And then- 
just the idea and I like how you described it earlier like just the performer on stage alone with no mm-hmm. props and mm-hmm. essentially like telling a lie and I feel like that's almost yeah. like almost a brash way of describing what storytelling is yeah. and it's telling a lie that people believe yeah. in that moment that mm-hmm. where like the, the audience knows that there's a whole reality there's a whole world going on and yet mm-hmm. they come to see you because they want to be kind of enraptured in the yeah. moment they want to be immersed yeah. in the story that you're telling and that is a hard thing to do especially orally mm-hmm. um and in that way mm-hmm. and then rakugo as a device in the story yeah. to show how their the characters lives can be paralleled through the stories that they're telling because for example i think it was the first episode uh when yota gives a performance in front of his boss his yeah. old mob boss and the yeah. story he's telling is about a guy who used to be like in a mob and yeah. it's a reflection <laughs> of his old life and so mm. i think you know the uh, the mangaka was intentional and using that to show how hey like we're going to be paralleling the rakugo stories in this show yeah. to the characters lives and that was a good yeah. that was a good idea it was like a good way to ease us mm-hmm. into that kind of storytelling mm-hmm. the animation studio and like the i mean i think this probably also can be um it's probably not just all the animation studio i'm sure the manga panels as well like the way that they animate the rakugo performances right. are really compelling like you because mm-hmm. obviously you know it's it's one thing to like go and probably watch one of these performances in yeah. person because you're you're watching it with an audience it's an experience it's very immersive but when you're watching it like animated <laughs> through a screen right you know it's hard to capture that energy and so what the direct or like what the the anime actually does is like the mm-hmm. way that the scenes are shot it's like it it does feel really dynamic the other thing that we get in this first episode is we learn about the character of Shin or Sukiroku um who has passed away and the way that he's he's brought up in a few different ways in this episode mm. so he's first actually I can't remember what's first but we meet this character of Kanatsu who's like you know this young right. woman and she is kind of the ward of Kiku yeah um Konatsu actually kind of has this line where she's like it, it heavily implies or maybe she just says that like you know she blames Kiku for mm. her father's death she has a lot of like unresolved feelings about her right. father's death right. and then you also get this shot of Kiku sees like the ghost of Shin oh. um, I think it's in the car of him like so obviously like it's him seeing that like ghost of his late best friend mm-hmm. kind of plays into that um surrealist sort of feel to the show uh we can jump to episodes two and three which yep. is really when we are you know pulled back in time mm-hmm. to learn more about kiku's history and also shin's history so we do get you know surface level dynamic a surface level dynamic established between the two main characters personality wise um mm-hmm. and how they're different in that way but also skill wise and how yeah. that contributes to like their blossoming friendship but also like rivalry and mm-hmm. we love rivalry <laughs> Is it a rivalry? Is it a friendship? Is it a romance? We'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know. But we'll get there. Yeah, um, we'll get there. <laughs> so yeah, personality-wise, very much like a ball of sunshine x dark storm cloud I dynamic. Wrote, I wrote the literal same thing. I wrote, OMG, they're the grumpy x ball of sunshine dynamic. They're serving childhood yeah. best friends to lovers. That's what I put yeah. in. <laughs> I know. You know, I, I made a little note about their first bathhouse scene because I, I just made a note about how, like, I feel like in... <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I feel like related. in, like, slow burn, slice of life, contemporary stories, their um, strong point is that they have the time and the pacing right. to, like, slow things down and, like, flesh out scenes where you really get a good picture of character behavior. And I felt like it's, you know we hit the ground running with this because, you know, they go to the bathhouse and Shin is like singing really, really loud. He gets, he gets like splashed by other people um, (laughs) for being too loud. And then Kiku has this kind of like monumental scene where he like starts crying because 
if you think about like his background and where he came from as like yeah. an abandoned orphan at a geisha house uh with like uh, um with like an injury in his in his leg so that he can't mm-hmm. dance anymore it's almost like kind of tragic even just like in the character design of kiku like he's got this he has almost this like very white pale grayish yeah. complexion he's got this very yeah. like, long face dark hair um you know even like, as like a smiling. child yeah and then he's like a child and then we're also brought back into the 1930s mm-hmm. um and so it's you're, it's very much this like jarring switch, um, and so you kind of immediately have this contrast of like this kid who's been dumped here doesn't even want to be there versus yeah. Shin who shows up and is just like you gotta apprentice me yeah, like I, 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 you know what I mean? like that's how he talks. I think I love that one of their very first interactions between Kiku and Shin is that Shin is like. I'm going to prove that I'm good at Rakugo and mm. that I can be an apprentice. And he starts performing and he's so good that like Kiku, who is probably is like, like oh. the saddest that he's ever been in his life, <laughs> is like trying not to laugh mm. because like yeah. that's how good Shin yeah. is at at performing. Like he has this like natural affinity for it. Yeah, it was it was a nice episode. I mean, and we're in the 1930s, so, you know, kind of yeah. jazz age. <laughs> Yeah. your favorite age <laughs> my favorite <laughs> yeah i i like that point about how shin is like just naturally drawn towards this art form and he's naturally yeah. good at it and that's something mm-hmm. that comes back to a- really affect the characters throughout the story mm-hmm. and like i don't know i just really understand the feeling of like seeing other people who are just who are really really good at something and yeah for you it just takes so much effort and dedication and like i think there's a line that kiku says like where he where he says that he doesn't even like rakugo he was mm-hmm. kind of just there as you know in order to survive mm-hmm. but then he's naturally a perfectionist like he fought he does his best at whatever uh he has to do and he mm-hmm. needed to do it out of duty slash survival yeah. that's how he like kind of got into it and you know, that's such a contrast to uh, yeah. to Shin. Uh, in episode three, there's this scene where, like, Shin comes in while while Kiku is practicing. And he's he basically just, like, crashes his little practice. And mm. he's just like, you should try <laughs> practicing by, like, reciting erotica and, like, yeah. flustering him. And then they're just like, yeah, we should have a, hit up a brothel and everything. Yeah. I literally wrote, the yaoi tropes are jumping out. And then there's a there, Kiku says like I had I in in his narration because he's like narrating it like mm. future Kiku is narrating this moment and he's like I had no time whatsoever to think about women I was like okay sir. yeah <laughs> okay sir and then it was at this moment that I paused the show really? and I I went over to Google Chrome and I typed in the show's name (laughs) and then i clicked on the author i clicked on the writer and lo and behold because Mm -hmm. i was gaslighting myself Mm. i was like lo and behold she has a background in writing bl yaoi so i I am not surprised in the least and i literally was just like oh thank god because i was like am i gaslighting myself (laughs) Am I reading too right. much into this? The answer right. is no. But anyways, yeah, I mean, that was just quite, me going on. A, <laughs> that was just me going on a rant. As you go throughout the story, the more and more obvious it becomes. Episode two and three is like Kiko really struggling, not only with the art form of Rakugo, but also I feel like to establish an identity for himself. Like mm-hmm. they always go back to the idea of you need to find your own style of Rakugo, yes, whatever. Yes. You know, I think it's very just like his historical context wise very interesting to have this coincide with like the war um Mm -hmm. because i'm sure like realistically the war probably disenfranchised a lot of people including you know rakugo performers and Mm -hmm. just like entertainers in general something that i found really interesting about this section is that the whole narrative perspective is influenced by how kiku sees his own life because it's mm-hmm. kind of like kiku telling his own story to mm-hmm. kanatsu and to yotaro yeah and so when he says stuff like oh i never really was interested in women well we see that like in these episodes he has girlfriends okay like he had a girlfriend in the countryside and, and he had two. like another one i don't even remember because that's how insignificant yeah. They were. yeah he's just like and then there was this girl and then yeah. she left because of the war 
and they got they get what, like what? five seconds of screen time and it's like <laughs> it makes sense though because yeah, yeah. if he really wasn't interested in women it makes mm-hmm. sense that in the narrative of his life and in the retelling yeah. of it they get absolutely no sidelined yeah <laughs> like the the war is is basically like a backdrop of, of episode three where we also see yeah not only does kiku get separated from both his guardian figure his mentor his master yakumo but also from shin his best friend in this time you kind of like get that sense of isolation um and you also see how much rakugo becomes like politicized and censored in the 1940s and i think that that was like a a very it, it was just cool like i like when they're the when shows like this, stories like this, which are mm. very much um, internal conflict driven, very much like character studies, when they still kind of take the external world and, and you know, use it as yeah. context for the stuff that's like happening around them. I totally agree. And like, it kind of sets you up for future episodes too, because you know that like, in those days, people realistically, like, they weren't going to seek out entertainment because they were too mm-hmm. preoccupied with, like, surviving. But yeah. then after the war, we know that people, like, went to the theater in throes. Yeah. And so in it's in that, like, contextual environment that our characters really, like, the events that happened, the formative events in their lives really hit home because mm-hmm. that's when they thrived as rock and go performers you know mm-hmm. so it, it like all ties together really really well i agree yeah uh the next section of the writing that we'll talk about is episodes four to six um so at the start of episode four or at some point in episode four we meet the character of mio kichi who is a geisha uh, yes <laughs> um <laughs> we'll talk more we'll talk more about mio probably in our bechdel test mm-hmm. segment but um i think it's I okay. I think it's so interesting that okay, the character of Yakumo, like the seventh generation, mm. so the the master mm-hmm. um mentor of Shin and Kiku, like he's not really too much of a character, but I feel like at the start of the show they're kind of like setting up certain elements of his character like to kind of like give a sense of like what kind of person he is because mm. <laughs> he's obviously very revered because he's like he's taken on the Yakumo name mm. he's very respected he's a master whatever but in this episode he like shows up to meet up with Shin and Kiku mm-hmm. he's brought along this geisha right. and it's like heavily implied that like this is like his mistress yeah but he's also like bring like he's brought the geisha for Kiku right um <laughs> Like, you know, to introduce them or whatever. But it's also yeah. like... It's um, definitely your own mistress, sir. Yeah, it was it was just really weird. Like, I was literally like... Yeah. Huh? <laughs> and there's also this part of, of the episode where his master, so Yakumo, tells Kiku that... Um, I can't remember the exact words, but he kind of like says something about like... Um, Kiku has to learn from Shin's shamelessness um and that's where his charm comes from because that's his that's shin's flaw is that he's very Mm -hmm. abrasive he's very shameless but people are drawn to that Mm -hmm. and so he actually uses the word um eroticism there's something erotic about flaws Mm -hmm. um, because flaws are charming they make Mm -hmm. you feel at ease and so that's the same thing with rakugo and then afterwards hmm. it literally cuts to a scene where he's like here's my mistress who's also a geisha <laughs> and it's just like oh okay <laughs> yeah it, this episode definitely or these episodes definitely further explore the differences between kiku and shin and mm-hmm. like further enlargens that gap in episode five there's like a performance um with a bunch of the uh, like younger, mm. what's it called? Younger Rakugo performers, where yeah. they're kind of like putting on this like play or whatever. And there's this scene where um, Kiku has to play a woman in like, you know, makeup and like a kimono and everything. I really liked the whole sequence, like the mm-hmm. the way that the the play plays out and the way that we see Kiku's character kind of like he comes into himself a little mm-hmm. bit in an interesting way when he he comes on stage and starts doing this performance as a woman and starts to see how 
people respond really well to him embodying this like new persona this new character Mm -hmm. i also flag that performance as kind of like the beginnings of his realization of Mm -hmm. his identity as a rakugo performer yes and i also made a note about how it's it kind of hints at kiku being the embodiment of like a of selfishness at least in contrast to yep. Shin. Uh, yeah, in episode six, we really explore the idea of like why why do Rakugo? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of ties into what you were saying there, where like um, Shin kind of explains. I think this is in episode six. Yeah, it was. Shin kind of explains that you know the. He does Rakugo because he wants to make people happy. He wants mm-hmm. to do it for other people. And he really mm-hmm. gets his, like, joy and strength from that. And the realization that um, Kiku comes to in this episode is that he performs best when yes. he is performing for himself. Yes. To make himself happy. And I thought that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's a fairly simple character beat to hit. Like, mm-hmm. oh, on one spectrum, you're there's someone who like just like does it for the love of the game, just like right. does it for to make people happy. And on the other end of the spectrum, it's just like doing it for like self fulfillment. As I said before, the characters themselves also embody particular roles slash arguments for the preservation of Rakugo or the adaptation of it to modern times because Mm. we know that Shin is supposed to embody you know a very selfless art form he does it for the people and for the art whereas Kiku is more selfish Mm. and but at the same time those characters are also used to uh to go against each other in Mm -hmm. the question or the conflict of whether you know in preserving a traditional art form is it better to preserve the actual form of it in in its current state or to Mm. adapt it to you know changing social conditions Mm -hmm. and there is almost like a selflessness in adapting because you're kind of like molding it and changing it in order to appease the masses whereas a selfishness in preserving what you think is already beautiful and you think should be Mm. kept the same and so you know it's it's cool to see that on like a character level, but mm-hmm. on another plane, it's also cool to see that being used to have these two characters embody these differing ideals. Going back to Mio's character, because she's mm. present in these episodes as well. Um, I think it's, for me, like the minute that Mio showed up on screen mm. um, and she's introduced as a geisha, I was immediately like, oh, and this is the, again, the benefit of having that frame story, having mm. that... Um, the, the setup of the present timeline mm-hmm. is that we know from episode one that Kanatsu um, has said that her mom was a geisha. Right. And so it's right. really interesting because you get to this part of the show, this like midpoint of the show, and you're like putting two and two together and you're like, but wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. She has a relationship with Kigu, right. not Shin. I think that's a good transition to talking about them like in episode seven to nine um yep we'll which is the part them. in their adulthood you know um yep. and let me just say let me just get this out of the way it is hard to watch oh it is hard to watch this girl it is hard to watch. try so hard <laughs> she's trying so hard so I was like, hard i was like girl. i was like the girl <laughs> he like the man physically pushes her off of him. Mm-hmm. He doesn't meet her. He doesn't meet her eyes. He looks absolutely miserable in her presence. It's like he's gay, Your Honor. <laughs> yeah, Your yeah, Honor, yeah. no cap. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and like the thing is, and we we are going to talk about um, the the queer lens as a subtext, but yeah. as you know, as text 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 text. I wouldn't be surprised if Uh Kiku himself didn't know why he was acting that way, right? Because feelings, I don't know, feelings of guilt, feelings of inner turmoil, they can, those things can lead people to do things, to do inexplicable things. And I'm sure like, sorry, I'm speaking about Kiku as if he's like my friend. I'm sure he (laughs) didn't mean it, but like, yeah, I, I, you can only, you're, the audience is left in a position where they can only guess 
why uh-huh. he's yep. acting that way. The way the reason that he pushes her away is because like he has in his mind he has no time for anything else. Like mm. it's rock go all the way, baby. Like yeah. he has he has no time for anything else. <laughs> right. And even when he pushes her away, he doesn't even seem that pressed about it. He goes on a trip mm-hmm. with Yakumo out of town. Right. Doesn't even tell her. But then he comes back. Mm -hmm. And he sees Shin, his best friend, Mm -hmm. and Mio, his girlfriend. They're hugging, hugging, they're consoling each other. Right. They're kind of having a moment. And, like, he... He doesn't even get mad about it. Like, he argues with Mio, but then he goes to talk to Shin after. And he's like... So what's up, He's no thoughts head empty. (laughs) He's just like, yeah, whatever. So when they're having this moment, like, you can clearly tell that, like, you know, Shin's attracted to her. But Mio literally says, like, I, it's, it's nice guys like you that I can't stand. She says that to Shin. And so she's kind of almost, she's very much someone who has these self-destructive tendencies. Right. Um, That's a good way of putting it. And which makes sense given her, her background. But she's, like, self-aware that, like, being in love with men that neglect her is stupid. But Mm -hmm. she's, she's still kind of, like, she can't get away from it. Yeah. And, it makes her, to be honest, like, Mio is a character that really fascinates me. She frustrates mm. me, but she really fascinates me because I <laughs> right. think, like, everything about her character construction makes so much sense. Mm. But you feel so bad for her, man. The yeah. other thing that's being set up in these episodes is, as you mentioned, um, Shin kind of embodies this idea of this, like, modern world that people Mm -hmm. are slowly not enjoying Rakugo as much as they used to. That's actually causing a rift between Shin and the elders of of like the Rakugo council or whatever it is. And it kind of starts to set up what becomes a core part of the climax, Mm. which is Shin constantly butting heads with like the bureaucracy and the politics and the the traditionalism and it's kind of this same conversation right that drives that forms a rift between him and yeah. his master um mm-hmm. just to go into episode nine yes. what ends up happening is they get into an argument and he gets expelled from the Rakugo yeah. association and i just mm-hmm. want to talk about that because the way that this is like really the catalyst for the climax and both Mio and Shin's Mm -hmm. downfall because um, right after that happens, the two of them meet at night in, um, oh, I forgot where it was, but they meet on a bridge and there is just so much like symbolism there because, you know, they both, Mio's just been broken up with. She's been Mm -hmm. outcasted by Kiku. Yes. And Shin's just been outcasted by his master. And so they're both in a place where they're like struggling to find where they belong now. Mm -hmm. And they find each other on a bridge to like death, essentially, because that's kind of like where their lives end. And Mm -hmm. that's the start of, you know, they agree to run away together. uh, Soon after, like, she gets pregnant with his child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just, like, kind of their turning point for the two of them. I think the payoff of seeing how Shin and Mio eventually get together is very interesting. Because for me, at least, I was waiting for it from the start of episode Mm. four or five or whenever she's introduced. I was like, okay, what, what goes wrong that ends up bringing these two characters together? And I think the the series of events that slowly snowball into them mm. basically finding solace in each other right in a very superficial way i thought was like the payoff of that was really cathartic is not the right word because that has a positive connotation <laughs> but just like you know what i mean yeah like yeah. you're waiting for it and when you see it you're like oh damn there we go yeah yeah i just want to also talk about this happens in episode eight um but it's, mm. it's a conversation that happens between Shin and Kiku. It's one of my favorite scenes in the show, actually. Kiku and Shin go to a jazz bar and they're basically (laughs) having a conversation. (laughs) First of all, jazz bar. I write like 80% of my stories in jazz bars. And they're basically just like having a conversation about the modern age and how that is starting to conflict with Rakugo as an art Mm. form. And so Shin talks about this idea of Rakugo being like very stuck in the past and that now in the modern age, you know, mm. the reason we have to innovate is because there are all these other forms of entertainment for the masses. Mm-hmm. And they're having this conversation in a jazz bar and it like pans out to see, you know, this whole, this like full crowded jazz 
club that's just like enraptured by this jazz performance and Mm -hmm. then here are these like two guys talking about you know a 400 year old art form like of of comedic storytelling and i thought that that contrast that setting for Mm -hmm. this specific conversation was very intentional and like i said before this show acknowledges that you need both right yes and if we're gonna say that each of these characters are embodying each like the two different sides Mm -hmm. i think it's even more interesting that shin dies at the Mm -hmm. end of season one and Mm -hmm. no spoilers or anything but season two i feel like really explores the idea of like okay what happens when you just are too inclined towards one side you know and all of the conflicts that come out of that so yeah definitely like a very well thought out plot point and also like Mm -hmm. a narrative theme to to hit so we start to see very clearly um what shin has to sacrifice i guess in order to stay true to his like ideals and right and and you know he loses everything in the process and then kiku by contrast is kind of like he's propelled into this like status and fame he's told Mm. by his master that you get to inherit the yakumo name and everything but you know in the process kiku has kind of you know lost out on like his his friendship his relationship with mio and everything and so even that contrast i think is culminates and explodes very Mm. well in episode nine finally like a real true argument between shin and kiku um where shin basically kind of like has this outburst and is like you know you've always been the master's favorite you were always doted on from the beginning in my notes i wrote deku x bakugo but bff (laughs) version (laughs) because it's it's an exploration of their relationship as rivals i think right any any exploration of rivalry is it's automatically Deku X Bakugo. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I just want to make a note um, on one scene in particular that happens in episode ten, and okay. it's when Kiku kind of gets his first this person seeking to be his yeah. apprentice, mm-hmm. and this guy is like, "Take me in!" Like I abandoned my parents and yeah. my family because they all hated Rakugo, and Kiku replies with. Well, if you can't even convince your family, what makes Savage. you think an audience is going to listen to you? I think it allows us to gain some insight into Kiku's current state of mind with regards to um, people who choose to pursue Rakugo. And it also gives us some insight into why in the present time he chose Yota to be to really become his apprentice because to mm-hmm. Kiku... Rakugo is not a blessing. I feel like maybe this is me, just me reading into it, but it feels like he thinks of Rakugo as like the end of the line. If you have like a family to go back to, Mm, if you have a support system behind you, go back to that, like run away. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because Yota came from a background where, you know, he just came out of prison. He has nothing. Nowhere else to go. Yeah, exactly. So Kiku probably saw something in him and was like, Sure, I'll take you in because this is the uh-huh. end of the line for you. There's another scene the, that happens in episode 10, which again, it, it starts to tie into the whole feeling of this mm. show being very whimsical, mm-hmm. being so wacky that it could also yeah. be a Rakugo tale itself. And that's the scene where Yakumo, seventh generation Yakumo, mm. so Kiku's master, is on his deathbed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there is so much going on in There's that so scene. Like, okay, let's, uh, let's un- break out the scissors because we gotta this. unpack this. Yeah, essentially, what we find out is Yakumo is on his deathbed. Right. And um, he expresses regret for how he drove Shin away. Oh my god, it's stories within stories over here. Oh my god, my brain is like... So how do we even get, start? Yeah, so we kind of get thrown into like a mini montage right. flashback type thing where Yakumo starts recounting an aspect mm-hmm. of his childhood to yes. Kiku. Yes. Basically, he had his own kind of rivalry mm. with a man, with another boy named Sukeroku mm-hmm. who ends up be who we find out is actually the man who raised Shin. Mm-hmm. He he basically sort of like he knows that Sukeroku like deserves right. to have the Yakumo name but kind of uses his own like 
ties and influence and like nepotism to like mm-hmm. get the Yakumo name for Usurp himself. Usurp the throne. Yeah, he usurps the throne. He the whole point of this is that he's expressing to Kiku like I, I like you are going to carry on the Yakumo name, but there is a burden and a curse mm. that comes with being yeah. Yakumo. Like following this conversation, Kiku kind of wants Shin to now take on the Yakumo name because mm. in some ways it feels like righting a wrong, you know, like mm-hmm. his sensei, their sensei made this grave mistake yes. in stealing this name and this fame for himself. I, I like the word that you use as a curse, the, the curse of the Sukuroku name. Yeah. And how it's almost like the characters are constantly trying to break out of this cursed cycle mm-hmm. because, you know, we have Shin who wants to take on the name of Sukuroku, but we know that the fate of the Sukuroku name is to end tragically. Right. And you so wish that it didn't have to be that way, but you mm-hmm. know it will be that way because we know already that Shin's going to be a tragic figure. We have Yota, who mm-hmm. is, by all accounts, a, a reflection of Shin when he was alive. Yeah. And you're kind yeah. of... And, and you have, like, Konatsu as well, right? A reflection mm-hmm. of Shin. And it's like what's going to happen to these characters because you know that there's such a exactly. cycle being, being you know, imposed on the characters yeah. here. I want to talk about the uh, performance that we see Kiku do after after Yakumo dies. Mm. Um, uh. He performs Shinigami, right. um, which I think is interesting that we get to see him perform Shinigami at this point in the show because we know yeah. in the present timeline that that's the performance right. that Yotaro was so enamored by. Mm -hmm. I love the way that the animation like plays (sighs) kind of like with the shot composition and like cinematography and everything to like convey how immersive this performance feels. Mm -hmm. And there's this really great shot. It's this shot of him finishing his performance, eyes closed. And it's when it zooms out, we see him on the stage, but uh, uh, like we don't see the audience. Mm. So everything around it is just like, black and Mm. then we hear the applause of the audience but we only see on the screen yeah just kiku alone on the stage and so we kind of get this like sense of solitude Mm. Mm. for me it felt like this reflection of like a how much kiku always says he performs for himself Mm -hmm. but b Mm. this point where kiku is kind of starting to feel the sense of solitude because I yes. mean his his sensei has just died. Yes. Um. Yes. His girlfriend and his best friend have run away to the countryside, and he hasn't seen them in like years. <laughs> yes. After all this happens, he eventually like resigns himself to actually go to the countryside and find mm-hmm. find Shin. I think it's funny that Kiku who comes from a background of having been abandoned. Like, he knows what it's like to be abandoned, and he hated it. And yet he, he like, made sure Uh that he lived a life of, or ended up in a life of solitude. And I think Mm. that's, like, really telling of sometimes what trauma can do to someone. That leads us into episode 11. Yes. (sighs) So, change in setting uh kiku finds shin and his daughter in the countryside and it's revealed that mio has left them no we don't know if this is like a permanent yeah. she's totally abandoned them at least that's what kanatsu thinks or yeah, she just she's, ran away she's kind of just ran away with another man mm-hmm. um but we find out also that mio has forbidden shin to do rakugo mm-hmm. and she this is like, like atrocious to, to kiku and to, <laughs> and to kanatsu first of all just the fact that like <laughs> Like, Kiku, who's, like, now, you know, really successful and stuff, mm. um, he shows up and he sees that, like, Shin and his daughter are just, like, living alone in this little shack. <laughs> but then Shin kind of is, like, a little unbothered by it at first. Mm-hmm. He's kind of just like, yeah, she'll be back or whatever. Right, like, right. Which says a lot about their relationship <laughs> yeah. and also, like, where their characters are at at the moment, which mm-hmm. is, like, rock bottom. <laughs> um, and it's really heartbreaking, I guess, to see... Mm. The relationship that Shin has with Rakugo is like so negative now. Like he doesn't really want to think yeah. about it, and so right. Kiku kind of very stubbornly is just like, "Well, I'm not going back to Tokyo unless you're coming with me." Mm-hmm. Um, so he actually like just like moves in for a bit. He just moves in. He just kind of moves in for a bit. And okay, you said, "Do I have thoughts oh. on episode 11?" I do have thoughts on episode 11, and they're very 
they're they're rainbow colored thoughts. Mm. Like, can I just say, yeah, the, the domesticity of this episode is audacious. <laughs> You know what I mean, though? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, the shot it's... of them, like, walking through the trees, each holding Kanatsu's hand. Come on! <laughs> like... Domestic. It's domestic and you can't tell me otherwise. Like, mm-hmm. there's so many things about this montage in particular mm-hmm. that, like, feel very much like... It's kind of like, after everything that has happened, these two characters, plus Kanatsu, have mm-hmm. sort of found this, like, fragile piece that you kind of want to last... Right forever and it almost right. feels like they're on the cusp of this happy new right. re- rejuvenated life it's also a moment where kiku comes to this realization that like i don't want a life of solitude yeah. i do want to live with the people that i love like i want to live yes with shin and kanatsu and mio and then like it just like all falls apart <laughs> right on the note of of everything falling apart <laughs> Let's talk about that. Let's, Let's talk, talk about that. About so that. basically, Miss Mio, she shows up and she sees Kiku. First mm-hmm. of all, she shows up to the place where they're all staying at and she doesn't even want to say hi to her husband and kid. <laughs> she just shows up and it's just like she only wants to talk to Kiku. Right. And she's like, I've been in love with you this whole time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I always knew that you would show up and come back for me. Yep. Yep. And I was like, bestie, you need help. <laughs> no. I was like, she's such a tragic character. For real. I also get the sense of Mio being like, almost like a like an agent of death as well. Mm-hmm. Because the last time that Kiku and Mio talked to each other, mm-hmm. her line to him as he's breaking up with her is, the next time you see me, it will be mm-hmm. in hell. You know, yes. so yeah. and that was kind of like her transformation from just being like his girlfriend to like the one who's go- who's about to bring him down. She comes back to him, and the first interaction that they have after all these years is mm-hmm. it, it eventually escalates into her trying to get him to do a lover suicide with her, which is like a thing in Japanese literature. Yeah, um, and you know, one thing leads to another, and that the finale happens Shin tries to like grab onto her as she's falling off of the balcony or whatever and he's holding on to to Kiku's hand okay so things that I did think were interesting about this sequence was Mm -hmm. that Kiku for the first time ever acknowledges that he's the one who created this whole situation Mm -hmm. by driving her away all those years ago which is not something which is you know character development because before he used to like literally not care uh, like about anything about her and so up until that point i was like i follow it i follow it yes Mm. this checks out Mm -hmm. solve for x yep that's the answer but then like i i don't know the way that you're supposed to interpret this like that moment where he she kind of like leans in and she starts crying and he like leans in and kind of like licks her tears. Mm. I thought that was interesting because it's it's something, it's such a provocative oh. image. Is he giving in to her? Is he pitying her? Oh, I her? see. I see what is you Is it mean. like, like how was I supposed to interpret that moment? Yeah. Yes. And then Shin barges in and is yeah. like, I want to be with you. I want to raise this family together. I'll give up Rakugo right. to be with you. Yes. And I was like, what the frick is it's going so on? It's so fast. It all Everything so fast. feels so fast. And I think I was so, like, I just got whiplash. Because up until right. that moment, Shin was, like, coming to terms again with how much he loves Rakugo. And then all of a sudden, he sees Mio again. And he's just like, right. I'll give it all up for you. I'll give it all up for you. Which is, which is fine. But, right. like... And then within the span of like another 60 seconds, jumps out, balcony freaking breaks. Right. And he's like, I'll double suicide with you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Pardon? Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. I, yeah. Let me say something. Okay. Yes. I, In perspective now, I understand what you mean by the melodrama of the finale. Okay. Now that yeah. I'm, we're talking I about it, I shouldn't say melodrama. Really I take back the word melodrama, but I do... Okay. I would rather, I, I think I would say the like the wackiness of it. Yes. I understand, while I was watching it, I was like, I understand it's supposed to be surreal. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be like mm-hmm. something that you would hear in a Rakugo tale. Mm-hmm. And for that, it was effective. However, I think for me, 
if I were rewriting the show, yeah. which is like such a pretentious thing to say, but if I was, <laughs> I would I would have liked to see the show get more and more wacky and surreal mm. leading up to that point. Like I felt like it all happened in episode 12. Okay. I would have liked gotcha. to see I just wanted Agreed. it to be weirder. I Agreed. wanted the show to be weirder. Sorry, I'll stop talking. No, that I was all I wanted to say. <laughs> I completely agree with that. All I was going to say was exactly actually what you pointed out and acknowledged that it was like I said earlier this is all from the perspective of Kiku retelling his own story his own past and Mm -hmm. if he is a rockable performer you can't Mm -hmm. expect him to be a reliable narrator you have to expect him to embellish to lie and to wrap you up in the story Mm -hmm. and also like when Shin comes in his eyes red do you know what Mm -hmm. I mean and it's like at this point you're like okay I know this isn't real the a mirror of reality yeah yeah but you know there must be something in that chain of events yeah that compelled kiku to tell this story in this way even if it wasn't true Mm -hmm. even if it was you know wasn't at all what happened but i agree with you that it would have been more effective to have that ramp up earlier. Yeah, I, I think I agree yeah. with you on that one. I mean, episode 13 is basically just a wrap up. I like that a significant portion of episode 13 is cutting back to that present timeline. Cutting back to Kiku in the present mm. now, suddenly everything about his character is recontextualized to yes. us. He isn't just this like old grumpy mentor character. He is this character who's lived this entire life Mm -hmm. we see everything that he went through and i i want to talk about when kona reveals to yoda that she is pregnant and he asks her he like tries to pry like "Ah, who's the father like why can't you be together yeah (laughs) and she's kind of like none of your business which to yeah to me watching that for the first time was kind of frustrating because i was like wait I want to know who the father was too. Right, right. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I think that later in retrospect, looking back on it, I don't think it matters. Because exactly. what matters yeah. is that the fact that she's now pregnant and uh-huh. continuing the bloodline of yeah. Sukuroku is a huge thing for uh-huh. the future of this show. Because it is yeah. a generational tale. And now exactly. we know that a new generation is in the works. You kind of feel sympathy for for Kiku and you think about Mm -hmm. how much of a blessing a child is but also how much of a curse this is going to be for Kiku because he's like he's never going to not be haunted again like I really liked this idea of like Konatsu being pregnant and being like yeah it it literally it doesn't matter who the father is Mm -hmm. because like it's like she has this she's kind of taking a sense of agency in her life which mm. you know previously when we think about the main female character main female figure in the other timeline her mom mm. i mean her mom has always kind of felt right. like she's never had any healthy relationships or never had any agency really like mm-hmm. in her character arc i think was like a very it was a really nice way to like wrap up her character in this first half of the season and to set up um I guess what she'll go through in the in the next part of the show. That concludes our discussion on the writing. But before we move on, we got one more topic to cover, which is kind of like a sub segment, I guess, of our usual writing segment. We need to talk about the LGBTQ plus themes, yeah. the queer coding, the gay undertones, the because gay overtones. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's yeah, a lot. This show, she's a little curvy. She's a little yeah. twisty. <laughs> She's she's definitely not straight. Uh, you know, it's funny because, like, I'm pretty sure in one of my notes, I was trying to, like, describe Kiku and one, in contrast to Shin. And one of the words that I used was, he's very straight. Because I'm, I'm trying to say, like, he's very, like... Straightforward. Straightforward, yeah. Yeah. And then I went back on it and I was like, mm, that's not the right word to use. <laughs> that's not the right word to use. And we're not, like, bringing this up to insist that any of these characters are, like flatly canonically gay like you know whatever your definition of canon is because they never refer to it specifically exactly but there are moments in the story that appear to be queer coded that you know leave room for interpretation leave room for queer readings on certain characters and i think it's really interesting to look at this 
story and be able to interpret it in more ways than one. Most notably, the relationship between Shin and Kiku could be seen as platonic or as romantic. And I would say there's a case for both Mm -hmm. being true. The writing of their characters was always treading the line. Like, Mm -hmm. dare I say there there wasn't even a line? But if there was, it was a very thin. Right. It's masked by by Kiku's seemingly uh, seemingly obsession with Rakugo because he you know mm-hmm. he says all these things like I'm disinterested in women I'm only interested in yeah. Rakugo yeah. but then he never displays the same amount of emotion with Mio that he exactly. does with Shin and he's always saying stuff like you know yeah. I want to share things with you I want to like spend time with you but I yeah I, I want yeah. to be alone because I want to focus on Rakugo. So mm-hmm. he, it's it's like he has to stick with this story that he's been telling people, even exactly. though he knows that he shares a really deep connection with Shin. I literally have a note in episode one where I was like, why is Yakumo or like, why is Kiku's ghost friend giving me, you know, really? Vibes? You yeah, thought that literally. in episode yeah. one? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, first of all, Kiku's aversion to like physical or emotional intimacy always prioritizing Rakugo, like you mentioned. He never really seems bothered by it. And I think there is a very strong case for Kiku's character being interpreted um, maybe as asexual or aromantic or somewhere on that spectrum. But his relationship with Shin, here's the thing. It's not any one moment that stood out Mm. to me. It was a collection of moments. So there are things Mm -hmm. like the framing of certain shots, even just like, in the, in the in the tropes, you know, like Kiku cleaning Shin's ears to get him to fall asleep. Which I didn't episode. know. We had a conversation about this. I didn't know that yeah. was like a a very a like thing. romantic gesture. I don't know, know if it's like romantic or sexual, but in any ways, in any way, it's like yeah, yeah that has connotations right. to it. And stuff like that, you can almost hand wave it, right? You can mm. just be like, eh, it's probably just like whatever. It's a throwaway thing. But I think the fact that they're there is certainly not a coincidence or it's Mm -hmm. not an accident. And then there's the bigger stuff. Like for me, like I was mentioning, the last few episodes where Kiku goes to find Shin and Konatsu in the countryside, it doesn't seem like anything explicitly romantic, but when you watch it, you can't say that it doesn't have romantic undertones. But I would also say like on a related note, the story contemplates on gender, sexuality, gender norms and roles. We see this with Mio's character as well. I think that the show could have dug a little deeper into that theme, but even the scene where like Kiku has to dress as a woman for that performance, thematically, symbolically, Mm -hmm. there was a lot to unpack there. Yeah, yeah, like agree. The fact that he has this performance as a woman and it's a turning point for his internal conflict and his self actualization, I guess. Before the performance, he's you know he's when he's dressed as a woman he gets yeah but even like right before he's about to go on stage he gets really nervous yes he wants to like literally dip he's like i can't do it but then shin shows up and he's he convinces him to stay and he's just like just give it your all whatever and kiku literally like comes out of his shell and he like crushes his performance and in a queer interpretation of this show you could parallel that to being some kind of sexual awakening or at least him embracing this different side of himself that he didn't know was there. I think the details are there and given those details, like I'm not saying Shin or Kiku should be gay or anything like that, but you could headcanon both characters as fluid, as somewhere on the spectrum. And, you know, again, the mangaka having had this like background in like Mm -hmm. writing a lot of BL work like she knows what she's doing if she puts in queer subtext she put it in there I do like though that it is subtext because I think it's very realistic in that time period yes for it to be you know just implicit and also just like and not even with this like interpretation just with like any theme Mm-hmm. when it's like barely there i think it makes it more enriching yeah, like the story itself yeah. do you know what i mean 
it's a queer interpretation of the show. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that nothing is defined Mm -hmm. gives you that space to read into scenes in more ways than one, which again, I think like it adds to the nuance. And yeah, like just what you were saying with this being a period show, I think you have to look at this story as not only a story with queer undertones, but as a historical story with queer undertones. And for me, like I couldn't help but feel like the fact that the queer undertones are never brought to the surface, that they stay in the subtext, that restraint is almost a reflection of the restraint and suppression of feelings that queer people in real history had to exercise themselves. And so I feel like there's a valid interpretation of Kiku and Shin wherein their relationship could just be like they there are these like queer undertones to their relationship that they don't even know about this show is still great without the queer interpretation but i do think there's more nuance and more complexity to their characters when you do consider the queer lens because it makes you think twice about certain scenes i think that if the gay subtext was ever brought to the surface i'm not saying that it should be but if it was i think the art of rakugo would have been an amazing vehicle Hmm. or avenue by which the romance could have been subtly Hmm. explored. They're like practicing Rakugo stories together or they're reciting different stories to one another. And I just think that the narrative, that narrative choice could have lended itself so well to them maybe having a scene where they're playing a character or reciting a story. But there's this underlayer of them expressing feelings to one another with a barrier, with that mm-hmm. Rakugo barrier oh between them. Oh my gosh, that's so true. I never thought about that because you you can consider art as a medium for yeah. things that are hard to talk about, things yeah. that are potentially, you know, could potentially bring up tension, especially in a period drama like this. Yep. And, and so you use art as like a conduit you know, like even now, like even just generally using art yeah. as a conduit to get across exactly. emotions and feelings that are hard to express directly. Yeah, I almost like wondered, like in a version of this show where the romantic undertones were more explicit, mm. I was like, bro, you could do so much right. with you. Literally have this storytelling medium as a theme of your show, mm-hmm. and you're just gonna let it sit there. You're just going to let the gays sit there? Yeah. Uh, Anyways. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So for the next segment on the pod, we will be doing the Bechdel test. So if you're new to the pod, the Bechdel test is when we discuss the female characters, the female representation in the show using the Bechdel test, and it is a measure of female representation in media using three simple questions. So Mm -hmm. number one, are there at least two named female characters? Number two, do they speak to each other? And number three, do they speak to each other about something other than a male love interest? Mm. Okay. The first thing I want to say, though, is that (laughs) I acknowledge that the Bechdel test, it it is a little reductive. We do acknowledge that. However, right. However, there's some merit to the test. And this show, certainly its singular focus is definitely Rakugo. (laughs) Yeah. And and Shin and Kiku. But does this show pass? Two named female characters. There's Kanatsu and Mio. Mio, which are mother and daughter. That's two. <laughs> we never see them speak to each other. <laughs> no. Yeah, this show is not going to pass. So, yeah, I'm not going to let it pass. We talk a lot about how, like, women sometimes, female characters sometimes serve a particular purpose, are used to serve a particular purpose in a show. And I feel like that very much happens here. No further comments. No further comments. And you know what? Not every, like, and that's fine because you're going for a specific narrative. Exactly. Yeah. And it's also, we do understand that this is a period piece. Yes. So, and, and not only is it a period piece, but it's a, it's told from the perspective of Kiku, who is pretty singularly focused on himself and his own journey. Yes. And, 
self-proclaimed well. has no interest in women. So mm-hmm. you can understand why in his perspective, he wouldn't really think that much about any of the women in right. any more complex or nuanced way. So obviously we For are sure. taking into perspective the like the narrator and you know his mindset before we talk about the characters though kiku has like okay i don't know i don't know if this is too harsh but there are moments where kiku where i was literally just like ooh, we got a little misogyny vibe oh yeah <laughs> yeah like not in a go on not in any like egregious way there's yes. definitely this theme i haven't watched the second half of the show but there's this theme of like yeah. Rakugo not being for women. Yeah, and yeah. I don't know if that's explored at a later point in the show, but I do feel like that was a strong plot point, strong theme. It was kind of like it was put mm-hmm. on the table and then Kiku like shot it down in a couple mm-hmm. instances in the show and then it was like never re-explored. And I felt like that mm-hmm. was a missed opportunity to like talk about like what does it mean if you had a woman who kind of wanted to do Rakugo, like, you know, Mm -hmm. what would it mean to, like, dismantle the patriarchy? (laughs) You know what I mean. Yeah. Right, right. I think that, like, there is an acknowledgement towards the end, though, where he is like, oh, like, Kanatsu doesn't want to get married. Women can do whatever they want. He does say that, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and I think it's... You know, it's nice to see, like, an, the evolution over time. Of his mindset, yeah. Of that, of not even his mindset, but, like, the mindset of the of society, right? Because mm, I think, true. like, Kiku is very much a part of that society, and he's a product of that. So, yeah. And when I, when I bring up, like, <laughs> oh, my God, he has, like, misogynistic comments, it's not to right. be, like, yeah, cancel Kiku, he's a bad character, right. this is a bad show, mm-hmm, this is bad mm-hmm. writing. Because characters can say things that you as an author don't believe, of course. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But I just thought it was interesting. I bring it up because I would have liked that theme explored more. So <laughs> let's talk about Mio, yes. one of two named female characters. Yeah. Ah! Okay. She was an amazing device. Um, I think she did sure, yeah. her character and the existence of her character mm. serve so much to drive the plot and make it interesting and to serve the char- the main characters. Um, but that was it. Uh, I, do, I, I agree with you that she definitely does drive the plot in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And I think because, again, we get this story from the perspective of Kiku, who you know, probably doesn't, like, pay that much attention to her and her issues. Like, that is Mm -hmm. a factor, I guess. But, yeah, I have a lot of conflicted feelings about her. I actually Mm -hmm. wrote in my notes that she felt not the most human, but she felt very, like, believable as Mm -hmm. a character when you take her in isolation. Like, to me, like, a plot device type of character, I mean, that's... That's Julia and Spike, you know what I mean? Like, what yeah, the yeah, frick, that's a little bit more what obviously. What the frick do you know about Julia? Right, And right. nothing, which is intentional. Whereas, like, with Mio, I was like, I could see beyond the shadow mm. that she was casting. Like, I could almost see the outline of who she was or who mm-hmm. she is as a person um, in the sense that she she has these self-destructive tendencies, this toxicity, um, these commitment issues that all stem from a very specific type of life experience. Yes, she had to like yes. basically work as a geisha and as a prostitute to survive and like everything about her felt very logical and real. Mm-hmm. She was very tragically believable or believably mm-hmm. tragic. I don't know, yeah. one or the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She almost adopts this like role of a shapeshifter, which yeah. maybe contributes to her unlikableness and to her to the tragedy of her character Mm -hmm. that she's forced to do that because you know there's this whole idea of her conforming herself to become yeah whoever whoever she's engaging with yeah exactly whoever they want her to be i don't think in her nature she is the person that um she thinks 
Kiku wants her to be, but mm-hmm. that's what she wants to be. That's what she like exactly yeah. strives to be. Yeah. Um, and so that's why she loves being with Kiku so much because she gets to play this persona of a girl that she's always wanted to, uh, whose identity she's always wanted to yeah. take on. Yeah. But that isn't her, and that's also kind of like really, really sad. <laughs> I know, like she says that like at some point in the show that she was like, you know, draw- she's continuously drawn to Kiku because mm-hmm. he's never sexualized her on like other men. Mm-hmm. He's like not like other men. <laughs> he doesn't objectify her, but he also doesn't love her or pay her any attention. Yeah. So like, mm-hmm. the idea of like her commitment issues and, and struggles with men and romantic relationships also bleeding into all her other relationships, like literally mm-hmm. running out on her kid. It paints a pretty holistic picture of her. In general, I didn't have like too many issues with her character when right. I take her. I actually really like her character. Me too. I did I think like her that too. She yeah. played like a major role in yes. the story, at least. Yeah. It wasn't like a throwaway character or no, a side character. Yeah. Like, I would argue that she was one of the main characters. Let's talk about Konatsu. So, so she's really used as like an agent of her father. For me yeah. personally, like I feel like from this season, I couldn't really take away too much other yeah. than that she's like complete opposite of her mother yeah i actually had like a slightly different interpretation of her i guess Mm. because like i've only seen the first part of the show but i actually felt like she has a little bit of both of her parents in her um especially like as a kid i mean she has her dad's like vitality like her his brightness and his enthusiasm Mm. for life at least when she was a kid um but then i feel like as an adult she has almost like her mom's I don't know what the word is, like her shrewdness, but she doesn't like fully have all of her mom's like negative, like fully negative traits, like all of that, like self-destructiveness and everything. Um, But then she also doesn't have her dad's like unwavering um, positivity as we see as an Mm. adult. So I think it raises a lot of questions about who Konatsu, how she was raised um, and mm-hmm. who she became in the in the time that we didn't see. If she didn't have like a support system or like if she has like a little like negative push over the edge, she could very easily become her mother. Like she's in a I very see. similar situation yeah. where she's this young adult with a child to raise. You experience the same loss and devastation alongside her when you see her mm. parents die. Okay, now we shall move on to best part of the show. Everyone's favorite. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> dumpster fire. Yep. The segment where we can just talk about anything that we want. No brain cells required. I don't even know what we're gonna talk about. I oh, mean, we're like, gonna talk about VAs actually. Okay, let's talk about we VAs. Usually, which... We usually talk about VAs, but right. we gotta talk about VAs for oh, this do show, we? especially because. A show about Rakugo is all about is is all about the VAs. I'll talk about like the five main characters voice actors. I feel like this was more exciting for me because I know you haven't like seen all of these, but I'm gonna talk about five voice actors and literally four out of five of these voice actors worked on Evangelion, Neon Genesis Evangelion. (sighs) Which is crazy. Ava is like one of the greatest animes of all time. Mm. Legendary, iconic franchise. And so all of them worked on it, which is also a sign of like how old and experienced these Mm. voice actors are. We'll start with Kiku's voice actor, um, Ishida Akira. I don't know if you're going to get this because I don't know if this character is like a main character, but he voices a character in Shugo Chara. And I don't okay. know if he's a, I don't know if this character is a main character because I don't really remember him. Do you want to try to guess which character he is? Like, Kiku has a very distinctive voice. Yeah. Um, was he one of the kids? Because if he was one of the adults, I'm not going to remember. <laughs> I think he's not an adult. <laughs> what does that mean? Tsukasa? I think he is actually an adult. Wait, but I, re- I his character art looks so familiar to me, though. Oh, this right, guy. this guy, this guy. 
This guy. Oh my gosh, where is he from? I think he was like one of Amu's love interests who was like vying for her attention. But isn't he or- old? Who was this guy? <laughs> he was definitely a love interest. Definitely. That's kind Maybe of like isn't that kind of problematic? Oh, of course. There's a lot of Cuz wasn't wasn't <laughs> Amu like a, a literal <laughs> child in literal middle school? Well, I mean, yes. And <laughs> don't defend that. Let's move on. Also voiced, and this, okay, because when I was watching the show, I was like, I know this voice. Like, I definitely know. And he voices Gara in Naruto. I know Gara. Oh my gosh, I have a huge crush on this it's guy. It's 100% Gara's voice. Respect. Period. Respect. <laughs> um, he also voices Kaoru and Ava. I know you don't know who that is, mm-hmm. but another character that some fans might say gives off not straight vibes. <laughs> okay, now, Yamadara Koichi who voices Shin. First of all, this man's kind of legendary. He's actually known for voicing a lot of, like, in in a lot of dubs for, like, big celebrity blockbuster movies. Oh, okay. So he's he's known for, like, dubbing over, like, voices of Will Smith, Jim Carrey, Eddie Murphy, Robin Williams, Brad Pitt. Okay, and then he plays Kaji in Evangelion. Um, But he does have a very interesting voice acting credits. A main character, and I would like you to guess who. Oh, no. I won't even tell you the anime. (laughs) You're just going to have to... It's something that we both watched. So... It's something generically we've... good in a good way. You it's know? something we've both watched. You could I anyone. know you know, and I'm not going to give you any hint. <laughs> and I want you to guess. Is who he an it adult is. or a kid? Or not a kid, but like he's he's got to be an adult. It's an adult. It's an adult. Okay, a main character, Spike Spiegel. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Wait. You're kidding. No, You're, it's not Spike. It's Spike. It's Spike. It's not. You just freaking yelled in my ear. Oh my god. It's Japanese. I see it. Shin, Spike Spiegel, yep. same character. Honestly, right? It's the same guy. It's the I same guy, it. same vibes. I got it. First try. Who knew? Okay, I feel like Spike is like a fixture of every freaking episode we ever do now. That's kind of iconic. Uh, that's like really iconic. Um. Okay. Then we have. Hayashibara Megumi, who voices Mio. Mio. Great um, voice, by the way. Like, great voice. Such a unique yes. drawl. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was actually shocked right? when I found out who her Evangelion character is. She voices Rei, and oh my god, like, Rei's voice is so different from Mio's. Honestly, just iconic. Like, iconic voice acting. Number four is Seki Tomokazu, who voices Yotaro. Mm. In Ava, he voices mm. he voices the character of Toji. I literally cannot believe that four of these voice actors have been on <laughs> Ava. And then he voices Rekka in Fire Force. Do you remember who Rekka is? He's like one of the oh. villains. Oh my gosh, the guy who the guy like, abused. Oh yeah, yeah. But you remember how how like happy go lucky his voice was? Yes, yes. Yeah. I see yeah. it. I mm-hmm. see it. Yeah. He voices a character in uh, Jujutsu Kaisen as well. So you can guess which one. Yeah. I the would main? say he sounds, um, I'm going to say not the main cast, but definitely a fairly important side character, fairly, not a nobody. Um, no, no. But he doesn't. Tell me if I'm on the right track. Does he voice a student from the other school? I'll say he voices a student. Definitely one of the sorcerer students. He doesn't really sound the the way that he does like I think his actually this will give it away I'm just gonna say that his voice doesn't exactly sound like I see the way that he sounds when he's voicing Yotaro or Rekka. right because that's what I was thinking well okay I have two guesses okay my first guess was the really buff guy from the other school that was my first oh yeah guess. um Toto what's your second to- guess? Toto what's yeah. your second guess and then my second one because because I'm going to come from left field a bit. It's um, the one who, like, use, the senpai who uses his voice. Oh, to, like, that's a good guess. It's not either one of them. It's it? not. You were on I the right. Know. You were kind of on the right track with Toto. Okay. He actually voices Panda. <laughs> that was my third guess. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and then the last voice actor is Kobayashi Yu, who voices Konatsu. She also voices a character in Attack on Titan. Guess which one? <gasps> oh, Annie? No. Krista? No. You have one more guess. Uh, what's her name? Sasha or something? Yeah, it's Sasha. Yeah? <laughs> Were you just going to go down the list of girls? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, I okay, was, okay. You know, okay, I, I kind of regret saying Krista because I think Krista has a very particular Krista's voice is voice. very particular. Yeah. But I was going for like Annie or like Sasha, like a more like deeper toned Annie voice was a good guess. that I feel like Annie was a good Kanatsu's, guess. Kanatsu's, Kanatsu's VA does have. Anything else? <laughs> The first, okay, so I do have like a dumpster fire section in my notes. Yeah. I said, the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nothing ever good starts with that sentence. I was <laughs> the like, way? the way that young Kiku is my exact anime type was embarrassing. No, because think, think, think of my track record and then right. think about young Kiku. Right. You know, I do have a similar thought. Track record. In my notes. The only thing I have, though, along those lines are... Yeah. Why does Kiku with glasses... No! <laughs> oh, shut the... I was about to swear. You know what I'm talking about, right? It just stops. <laughs> but I think it's it's like weird almost because it's like you know what he looks like as an old man like there is like, okay stop a canon, everyone ages you know? okay we're not talking about the stop. but yeah i agree it's like okay mio like okay the attraction. <laughs> it's just funny because like he's acknowledged in world to be like a mm. good looking guy right yeah so and- He's acknowledged out of world. And, yeah. and he's acknowledged <laughs> out of world. Okay. I feel like Shin is like a Chad. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and there's something about Kiku that is like very like mysterious. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. look me in the eye. <laughs> I can't. Like mysterious and like, like sensitive. Shut, he's not sensitive though. No, no, I, I know. Okay, okay, he's okay. Not. Yeah, he's not. But you get the. But he, vibe. he gives those. He gives like, that vibe. vibes, you which know is why he gets what all I mean. the. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, there's something about that that women are like attracted to, or men, so, you know. Yes, exactly. So yeah. you know, I see it. I see it. I also think End that of comments. when you take the Chad type and the quiet, reserved enigmatic type Mm, mm -hmm. one might say opposites attract (laughs) one might say it's a romance trope one might say ball of sunshine x one might say ball of stormy cloud type and i just think the mangaka knew what she was doing when she designed when she designed those characters um (laughs) why did you Stutter there. <laughs> I just stirs the characters. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it's late, yeah, okay? <laughs> Period. All I'm trying to say is Kiku has a Bashonen yeah. face. In conclusion, therefore. Are we surprised? No. Like, it's long. <laughs> <laughs> the nose is long. The angles are sharp. So, here we are. <laughs> why are we so confused why are we tr- right now? Why are we trying to be intellectual and dumpster fire? We're so confused. The confusion in our voices <laughs> is, is real. It's because we're trying to self-edit. Well, that brings us to the end. Yep. Of dumpster fire. Heck yeah. Um, let's move on to ratings. Maybe... It's an unpopular opinion. Uh oh. But I'm gonna rate this five out of five. <gasps> a perfect Suroku fans. Yes. I'm like a really big fan of <laughs> fan of <laughs> um like symbology and like foreshadowing motifs that are gonna be really important. Um, I said this kind of earlier in the overall impressions, but I love like when. 
I love like genre bending, mm-hmm. especially like anything involving sci-fi slash fantasy slash supernatural yes. with like a form of realism. And I think that while you made a valid point about wishing that it had ramped up earlier, mm-hmm. uh, I was still like really, really satisfied with mm-hmm. my yeah. first and second watch through. Like yeah. I came away from this season and show being like, like what just yeah. happened? Yeah. You know, and like I really felt so much for the characters and how tragic they were um on one level emotionally because like we got to know them but on another level just like appreciating them as symbols and as archetypes in and of themselves yeah like i thought that the storytelling aspect of the show like reigned true and for me that that's kind of like something that i really prioritized i'm gonna rate it uh four out of five portions of soba Mm. that you force your dad's best friend to buy you. Ah, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah, I was like kind of conflicted because I was like, how much did I like it? But at the end of the day, I was like, I enjoyed it. Like, I had a good time. And I think th- what tipped it over the edge for me was the fact that I felt like the writing was so smart. As a writer, I think I had a lot of respect for the way that the narrative was crafted um in terms of like the symbolism and the themes like nothing it was very efficiently written nothing felt wasted and i think Mm. that executing that is honestly a feat in and of itself uh the only reason that it's not perfect for me was it probably taste reasons i just wanted shonen just kidding (laughs) no no no. i just wanted it to be i wanted to be weirder like once i realized Mm. that the show was was genre bending and that it was meta I felt like there was right. so much you could do with that. And I like I wanted to do like I wanted to see more of it. But I don't think that that was like objectively mm. like I think she probably wanted it to still feel very grounded, um, which is fine. Well, thank you, everybody, for making it this far. We know it wasn't easy, but <laughs> uh, I haven't said that in a while. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on YouTube, Spotify. We're also on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts or really wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and we are also on Twitter at Into the Workshop. So give us a follow and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.